So this week we're continuing in our study of Joshua. We're up to chapter 7. And I've titled this lesson, The Battle of Ai, Part 1. Because chapter 8 will take us back to Ai again with another battle. But in studying these chapters and in thinking about Jericho, we, we were looking at Jericho last time as that, that representing that, that impregnable fortress or that, that type of battle that we were facing that we've either never faced before or we don't quite know how we're going to do it. If Jericho represents that, that we face every day, and we say, how in the world am I going to, whatever it is, that's Jericho. Then, if that's that for Jericho, we can look at AI as representing that internal or that fleshly struggle where we say, Ah, uh, that, that's just that's too little. I'm not going to bother God with that. Have you ever ever had a you know we have times of, of our prayer requests, and particularly I've noticed in our women's Bible study a lot of times we'll we'll have some pretty and we've done it here too had some pretty serious prayer requests, and then somebody will come up to me afterward and say, "Well, would you pray for such and such? It's it's really kind of minor. I really didn't want to mention it in the midst of all of those serious things. Sometimes we do that. We think, well. You know, this is such a minor thing. I won't bother praying about this. Well, that's what AI is like in the beginning. And by the way, it's, it's capital AI, and it, that's not artificial intelligence. When you and I see AI today, that's immediately what our minds go to. But this is actually the name of this city, AI. But uh, we, we'll see. We'll see in this lesson that nothing is too minor to take to God. And in fact. Sometimes it's those so-called minor things that can cause big troubles. So let's begin with prayer. Father, I pray that as we, we learn from this, this lesson that you will open our hearts and our minds to, to, uh, to hear you and to seek your face no matter the size of the battle, no matter the size of the struggle, no matter what, how well we think we have it together, we never have it fully together. So I pray, Father, that we will bring everything to you. You already know it. You already are aware and even of the outcomes. But I pray, Father, you will impress it on our hearts to bring everything to you. And may we learn from these scriptures. Bring to our understanding what you would have us learn this day so that we may walk in your path and we may serve you fully. In Jesus' name, amen. So beginning with verse 1 of chapter 7. Uh, it, it's uh, depending, of course, on what translation you're using. It, they're, they're worded a little bit differently. But in chapter 7, uh, verse 1 in the New American Standard, the very first word is, but. Oh, anytime you see that, anytime you see a, a, a verse start with but, beware. Beware of what's going to follow after that. In fact, if we go back and we pick up verse 27 of chapter 6, we read, So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land, but... And you can go, uh-oh. You, you know something's about to happen with this. I remember, in fact, I have, have a note here that uh, uh, something bad is about to happen. This is, uh, we, it sounds like a, a case of pride was about to happen. When we read the word but, then we know we're in for trouble. But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. Now remember, the things that was referred to as under the ban in chapter 6, they were just to destroy everything in Jericho. What would not burn the metals, the precious metals, the gold, silver, and iron, and so forth, they were to be taken into God's treasury. But everything else was considered, quote, under the ban, or your translation may say dedicated to the Lord. So, but the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in that. And you, you already begin to feel this tension. It's like sometimes we'll be watching a movie and Joe will say, something's about to happen, the music has changed. So you watch for that, something's about to happen. He goes on and says, For Achan, the son, and he tells us who he is, his line. Achan, the son of Camry, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, 
took some of the things under the ban. Therefore, the anger, anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. You know, what's interesting to me, though, is that as Achan took these things, the battle was raging, and they knew what they were supposed to do was destroy everything. You know, Jericho, the walls fell out. The, the uh, Israelites had surrounded the city, and every man went in, straight in, from where he stood because the walls fell flat out. And they were all doing what they were supposed to do except for this man Achan. And he saw some things that he wanted and he took them, as we'll see in a moment. But what's interesting to me is that God didn't say, wait, 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 no, no, hold it, hold it. Achan's not doing what he's supposed to do. God let it play out. Have you ever noticed how many times God does that or how often we see that in Scripture? It, he lets it play out. All of the, the polygamy that goes on, God lets it play out. Even though in Genesis, God said one man and one woman for marriage, yet God lets it play out. In, uh, in Matthew, I think it's, in, it's either in chapter 18 or 19, Jesus goes back and quotes that. In the beginning, God said one man and one woman, and yet all these multi-marriages take place and God doesn't say, uh, 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 don't do that. God lets it play out. And he lets us learn from the circumstances or the consequences of these. So he didn't stop everything and say, wait, he's not supposed to do that. He let it play out. And we, have, we may wonder, why did he do that? But I think the reason that he, he let it play out was to learn from it. Sometimes we learn our best lessons from, from something that, that God allows us to get into. But what he was doing was teaching Joshua a valuable lesson, and we can ask, did Joshua learn from that? Well, we'll see in a couple of weeks, he kind of pulls the same stunt again, so he didn't entirely learn the lesson. But the Israelites were, were completely and faithful and obedient to God before the battle of Jericho but not so much after the battle. But think about that. Don't we do the same thing? Like we were talking earlier about, about that, that boy in that wreck. Before something, or if we're in the midst of something, or we're, we're in a very difficult situation, we're praying, we're praying, we're praying. Oh, you know, so many promises are made before surgeries or before uh, in storms or in different si situations. Oh God, if you'll just get me out of this. As, as the saying goes, there are no atheists in foxholes. But yet, after we're through it, how much obedience comes afterward? How many promises are made before battles and surgeries that are never even thought of again? Another clue of what is going to happen comes in verse 2. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth -Aben, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. So the men went up and spied out the land. So we think about what's happening here. It said he sent the men from Jericho. The problem is they weren't camped in Jericho. They were camped over in Gilgal, which tells us if he sent them from Jericho, not so much had the smoke settled till he was looking at the next battle. He sent the men out immediately. He didn't inquire of the Lord, what's your plan? Remember, he inquired, he, he was praying or he was thinking about it before he battled Jericho because he didn't know what to do about Jericho. And the angel of the Lord showed up and he gave him the battle plan. Well, now he's had a great victory. Where's God? Let's just go to the next battle. Let's just go do what, what we're going to do. They were so excited that they, they didn't inquire the Lord, what do you want me to do now? Sometimes you and I, we're like that. We get so excited after a spiritual victory that we're sure we're, we're in God's will. We're on the right track. We just, we just keep it going. We need to always inquire, what would the Lord have me do? And, and I believe, now we don't know this for a fact, but this is my opinion. I believe that if Joshua had inquired of the Lord before he went on to Ai, that God would have revealed to him what Achan did that it would have been taken care of before the next battle. But he didn't. God would, God would have told him, I believe, but he didn't ask the Lord, what should I do next? He just assumed he knew the next thing to do. I, it reminds me of Ann Graham Lotz was on uh, one of the morning shows after 9-11. 
and they were, you know, they were grilling her. Where was God when this happened? And why did God allow this to happen? And, and this actually has come up at tragedies over and over again since then. But her answer was, God does not go where he is not invited. God was not invited to go along into this next battle at Ai. They took that upon themselves. As godly a man as Joshua was, God wasn't invited into his decision making. And as we'll see, the results were deadly. Moses had told the Israelites back in Deuteronomy 11 that the land they were entering was filled with hills and valleys. Well, you know, we, we live in an area of a lot of hills and valleys physically, but our lives are filled with hills and valleys spiritually. There are high places and there are low places. Our, our lives are like that. God promised to never leave us nor forsake us, but we have to seek his face. God will not go where he is not invited. Verses 3 and 4. So, so they, they came back to Joshua and they said, piece of cake. We, we just, we, we, you don't even need to send the whole, a whole army up there. Just only about two or 3,000 men need to go up to Ai. You don't even make everybody go there. There's such a few people. So about three or 4,000 men from the people went up. And then it ends up they fled from the people of Ai. They, they spies came back and said, piece of cake, don't worry about it. But then when they tried to attack, it was a rout. Now, I, I don't know about you, but as I, as I read this, I... I, I I imagine them come running down the hill. You know, they're, they're flinging armament and, and swords and shields and stuff here, running out of their shoes, you know, as, as the saying goes, with their tails tucked between their legs. Matthew Henry said, the way of sin is always downhill. I thought that was so good with that. And the people were, were terrified. Then verse 5 says, and the men of Ai struck down about 36 uh, of, of their men. Thank goodness, only 36. And pursued them from the gate as far as Sherebin and struck them down on the descent. And get this. So the hearts of the people melted. In this case, the people are the Israelites. The hearts of the Israelites melted and became as water. This uses the very same words that was used to describe the Canaanites over the Israelites. It said their hearts melted and became as water. Same thing happened now to the Israelites as they ran away from them. And now Joshua decides it's time to pray. Verses 6 through 9. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until, until the evening, both he and the elders of Israel. And they put dust on their heads. That was a sign of repentance and mourning. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why didst thou ever bring this people over from the Jordan only to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we'd been willing to just stay, just dwell on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what can I say? Since Israel has turned their back before their enemies, for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it, and they will surround us, and they will cut off our name from the earth. And what will thou do for thy great name? God let him struggle with it for a little while. I think that's interesting that, that sometimes God lets us struggle with it for a little while. He doesn't just fix it. He lets us deal with it internally. God didn't say, oh, that's okay, Joshua. Don't worry about it. You'll learn from this. No, he let Joshua and the elders struggle with it. They, they, they tore their clothes and they put dust on their heads. God did... He let Joshua cry out those painful questions that we all ask sometimes. Where were you, God, when this happened? Why did you let this happen? And Joshua's questions were honest. And, and he really cared, I think, about God's name. But he asked those questions. God let him get it out of his system. Have you ever kicked gravels in your driveway? I mean, you're just... You're angry or you're disturbed. You just, you got to get it out of your system. God allows us to do that. And then we can hear Him. I think He listens to our cries. He lets us get it out of our system. And then He speaks to us. Joshua, Joshua didn't really wish they'd stayed on the other side of the river. I mean, how many times have, have you said or have I said, well, why'd I ever, whatever. 
Why did I ever take this job anyway? Why did I ever move here? Why did I ever... A thousand things you might say. You don't really mean it, but still you have to get it out. It's frustration talking. We've all done it. We may not mean a word of it, but we say it anyway. Then finally God said, that's enough. So the Lord said to Joshua, rise up. Why is it you have fallen on your face? You know, reflection is one thing. Getting it out of your system is one thing. But if it lasts too long, it becomes a pity party. And there's work to be done. God revealed them the reason for the defeat. God allowed that defeat to happen. Verse 11, God said, Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. And... They have taken some of the things that were under the band, and they have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also put them among their own things. They have taken them into their heart. They have taken them into their home. They have taken them into their cells. As we said earlier, this phrase, the things under the band uh, or devoted things, uh, means those things that, that were supposed to be destroyed, but they didn't destroy them. Joshua gave this instruction on the seventh day of marching around Jericho, as we saw in chapter 6. But God said they had both stolen and deceived. That's, that's two separate sins. They took what they shouldn't have taken, and they were deceptive about it. Here's the thing. If you have to hide something, you know, you know that's not right. If you have to hide something or if you have to hide to do something, you know that's something you should not be doing. Verse 12, Therefore the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, meaning they run away in defeat, for they have become a curse. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. You've got to rectify this. You've got to deal with this sin. Joshua's got to deal with this sin that's in the camp. You and I have to deal with the sin that's in our own lives. We have It has to be dealt with. God said they couldn't stand before their enemies until these, these sinful things, sinful lifestyles, sinful things we do must be removed. You and I can't stand before our enemies. Regard, whether Whatever kind of enemy it is, whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual, until we remove known sin. Now, if, if it... If it's a sin that you don't know about, we ask God to show us those things that should be be changed in our lives. But if, if there is sin that you know, that I know is sin in my life, that has to be removed. Sin and God cannot live in the same household. Cannot, As Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. You'll either serve God or you'll serve the sin. So, so we need to examine ourselves like Joshua examined the Israelites. Verse 13, rise up and consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. It's going to give them to the next day. Why wait till the next day? Tomorrow. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, there are things under the man in your midst. Somebody knows it's there. You cannot stand before your enemies and to have removed the things under the ban from your midst. And he's repeat, repeated that. He said that twice. You cannot stand if there is known sin in your life. God said, consecrate yourselves. Well, we saw back in chapter 3 that they were to consecrate themselves spiritually. But here, they, they are to actually physically do something. There, they were to consecrate themselves because God was going to do wonderful things in their midst. Here, they're to consecrate themselves because God is going to show judgment. You cannot stand before your enemies if you have sin in your life. So this is what Joshua was to do, verses 14 and 15. He goes on, he tells them, you should go through the, the, the uh, uh, Israelites tribe by tribe, and, and you should go through each tribe and each family and then each individual in the family and over and over until you come down to the one who's responsible. But now this is interesting. As we said a moment ago, why wait till the next day? You think anybody slept that night? Was it, were, were they all like, 
like the uh, the disciples in the upper room. Is it me, Lord? Did I, did I inadvertently do something that I shouldn't have done? I don't think anybody slept that night. In verses 16 through 18, then we find it's the next morning. So Joshua rose early in the morning and he brought Israel by and he brought them by tribes. And he started with Judah and he went all through Judah's family. And he did it with each family, went from the family. That's why we were given this man's name earlier. He went through the family of the Zerites and then he, he brought them by, by, by individuals. And then he brought them by household, verse 18, man by man. And then he came down to Achan and he finally found him. I, you know, here's one thing I think the reason that it was the next day. I think it was an opportunity for Achan to confess. He had the whole 24 hours, he had the whole night to think it over and to know what he had done and to confess it. When he was caught, even then, and I think if he had gone to Joshua at any point during that and confessed, he would have been forgiven. But he didn't. And when he was called, it was still, it was not too late to confess, but at that point, it was too late to avoid judgment. Verse 19, and then Joshua said to Achan, My son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to him, and tell me what you have done. Don't hide it from me. One writer said, God always deals severely with sin because sin is severe. Achan's whole family would end up being punished. Why were they punished for his sin? Likely they were part of the cover-up. Verses 20 and 21 might make us think that he actually was confessing. And he said, he says to Joshua, verse 20, Truly I have sinned against the Lord and the God of Israel, and this is what I did. Verse 21, When I saw among the spoil a beautiful manner, a mantle, a covering, a, a, like a robe, from Shinar, it's from Babylon, and 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight. I saw all this stuff, and I wanted it. I coveted it, and I took it. And behold, they are concealed. Remember, God said it was concealed. Concealed in the earth. Dug a hole in the ground. In the earth, inside my tent, with the silver underneath it. Now, it, it, it looks like he confessed, and, and in a way he did, but it, was, it wasn't a, a confession for repentance. It, it wasn't a, I'm sorry I did it. It was more like we've heard people say, I'm sorry I got caught. He would have never revealed it had it not come down to him and it been pointed out. His words, uh, at least to me, have a defiant tone to them. I saw it, I coveted it, I took it, and I hid it. And notice he refers to the things that he took as spoils. That they were, If you were in a battle, you were allowed to take the spoils, but God said this is not spoils. God says this belongs to me. So Achan never did look at it as belonging to God. He saw it as first come, first serve kind of thing. They, these things were devoted to God. And the fact that he hid them proves that he knew it was wrong. You don't hide something that, that's okay for you to have. You hide it when you know it's wrong. His actions can teach us a great deal about sin. Every sin begins with a thought, I saw it. Probably every one of them saw these things. But he saw it and he wanted it. We all have a sin nature, but the actions of sin, the majority of the time, come from knowing that what we're doing is wrong. We, we know when we use language that we shouldn't use. We know when we act in a manner that is not befitting a follower of Christ. We know that. We know when we're doing these things. We know when we watch them and we participate in them. We know that it's sinful, but we want to do it. And we do it. We want it, and we do it anyway. He wanted it, and he got it. But then there are always consequences. In Achan's case, 
severe consequences. It meant death. Verses 20, 20, 22 through 26, as it goes on, we have, have the rest of the story. Joshua sent messengers. They, they got the, uh, uh, all the materials and the silver, and they took them, and they took, John, took Achan and his family, everybody in the family, and brought them up to the valley of Achor. And, and Joshua said, verse 25, Why have you done this? The Lord will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones. And then they burned them with fire after they'd stoned them with stones. And they raised up over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day. And the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. What, Achor did, what, what Achan did was steal from God. The things that he took belonged to God. Well, we, we covered a, a similar story when we were studying Acts. And you re, may remember that story where we talked about Ananias and Sapphira. They sold this piece of property, you remember. It, it was theirs to keep the money or to give it to God. But they lied about it. They said, oh yeah, we're giving all of it. And they knew they had not given all of it. And they stole from God. God said it was yours to start with. You didn't have to give it. But you said you did. And you kept part back. So they stole from God. What's important here, it's important to know Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. But the good news is, if you are a Christian, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, then your debt has been paid. The sin has been forgiven. But there's still consequences. We're, our sins are forgiven, but there are still consequences. There are still things that come about because of the sin. When we sin, 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we are faithful, if we confess our sins, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive our sins. But there's still consequences. Confession does not negate consequences. So we have to watch our step in the first place. So let's close with this. In this chapter, the Israelites are defeated because there was sin in the camp. Because of what this one man did. Because of what his family participated in, the deception <laughs> 36 people lost their lives in that battle because there was sin in the camp. Judgment came upon the camp. And so we have to ask today, are our churches in the shape they're in worldwide, particularly America-wide, but worldwide, are churches being defeated because there's sin in the camp? I mean, we... We could spend a long time going off on what's being done in some places that are called churches. Things that are being allowed. Things that are being taught. There's sin in the camp and the church is weakened because of it. So what do we do? Do we sit, do we sit idly by when we know someone is living in sin? First Peter 1, 14 through 10, 17. I'm not going to read all that, but it says, God says, you are to be holy for I am holy. There are things we know to do that we must do. If there is sin in the camp, if there is known sin in any of our lives, if, if I know that there's something that I'm doing that I should not be doing, I may be the one that brings defeat upon the whole. And that's true for all of us. We must confess our sin because we may be the one that brings the defeat. I mean, that's a sobering statement. How did Joshua and the elders find where sin in the camp was hidden? They examined. They examined each tribe, and then they examined each household, and then each family, and then each person in the family until the sin was found. So that's what we must do. We must examine our own lives. My work life, my home life, my church life, my, my marketplace life, every part of my life to see if I am harboring any secret sin. We must ask God to remove the scales of our eyes so that we can see it. We, we may not see where there's sin, but I guarantee you, if you ask God to show you that if there's something you should not be doing, now, he might not, if you ask that this morning, he might not show you by this afternoon, but you will start feeling uncomfortable. 
had, had a little lady a few years ago I used kind of some of that similar phrase in, uh, in Psalm 139 where it says, examine me, see if there's any wicked way within me. And a couple of weeks later, she came up to me and she said, well, it's all your fault. And I said, okay, probably is. And she said, no, she said, I prayed that when I went home. And she said, over the course of the next couple of weeks, she said, there was this program that we watched on TV every day. And she said, you know, I started getting uncomfortable with that. And I started noticing the, the innuendos and the things that were being said and done in that. And she said, I just got to the point that it just turned my stomach to watch that program. If you ask God, he'll show you. I, I guarantee you, he'll show you. He'll remove your, the scales from your eyes. Then you can confess it and beg him to remove it. And then we may serve him. And we may serve him here in this time and in this place where he has placed us. And so with that, let's pray. Father, thank you. Uh, th these are tough words. These are tough words to say. These are tough words to hear.